Welcome to another Directions Mag podcast, co-hosted with our friends at Eurissa. Hi there, my name is Micah Babinski, and uh, thanks for joining another Directions Magazine and Eurissa podcast. So you've probably heard the phrase that goes something like, when all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. This is a common mindset in the GIS industry, particularly with regards to the software applications and tools that we use. It means that when, when, you're, when you're really only knowledgeable in depth about a certain set of software applications tech and technologies, you start to look at every problem or every project within that lens, and it can be a little bit limiting. So as our guest today will attest, it's not always the best approach to choosing your GIS tools. So today we're gonna to be talking about open source GIS and particularly why someone with zero experience or only a passing familiarity with open source GIS might wanna take a closer look. But before we dive in, I think it's important to talk about what exactly does open source mean? For folks who might not be aware, in general, open source software is freely distributed and it gives open and full access to the source code behind the application. However, we do want to point out there is some variation in how open source software is licensed. So it's super important uh, and we encourage listeners to read the license agreements carefully and consider them when choosing what software and tools to use for your work. So, okay, with that out, out of the way, Sarah Yerman, would you tell us a little about your story and how you became a champion for open source GIS? Sure, Micah. Um, I started working in GIS as the, as the field developed in the 80s. And, um, you know, software and operating systems sort of washed through on an annual or semi-annual basis at that point. And I had one project where I had a really traumatic experience, not with the GIS software, but with Windows and Microsoft Word. And when I came home, I looked at my son who was running Linux at the time and I said, I don't care what you have to do to this laptop, but I never want to have to touch Microsoft Word again. <laughs> and so I became a Linux laptop user. And then I began looking around for tools for, for mapping projects and, and for GIS in general. And they were starting to emerge. At first they emerged only in Linux, but after a while they became um, cross-platform and much easier to talk about with people in general and it made it so that it was you know there were a whole as you were talking about tools there were a, an additional set of tools on the table for me whenever I looked at a new project. Thanks Sarah that's really cool um, I particularly like the note about uh, Linux because I am just starting to learn Linux myself and um, yeah so that's that's exciting thanks. My other guest is Tom Armitage. Tom, would you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a prominent advocate for open source GIS in the United Kingdom and beyond? So, yeah, um, I graduated with my master's in GIS in 2002. Uh, and then um, after several different jobs, wound up uh, at the University of Edinburgh uh, in their support staff. And part of my role was to teach GIS to the non-GIS people. So uh, uh, economists, social scientists, um, ecologists as well, these sorts of people. And we liked to, to produce a sort of a more balanced portfolio of the support materials we were providing. So we'd always have the usual Esri Art GIS, but when MapInfo withdrew their support for the UK academic sector in terms of um, uh, lower price software for the for academics, we looked around for an alternative and, and started using QGIS. Um, and as that built, um, uh, we got a bit closer to the, um, the the QGIS um, user groups in Scotland uh, who would frequently knock on our door looking for uh, places to host their, their get togethers. And, and that's how I slowly became involved. Um, but as my knowledge of the software grew, I, I came to love it more and more and got more and more involved in the community, setting up an in-house university community. And then uh, uh, last year, I wound up as uh, co-chair of the uh, 2019 Phosphor G UK conference, which was a large two-day conference, which we hosted in Edinburgh. 
very successful, loads of different businesses and and uh, and people from both academia and 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 across the commercial sector, government, local government, and national government as well. So a very successful event, and yeah, I, I just love talking about the software, sharing my experiences uh, on Twitter, on my blog, and that sort of stuff. So it, it, it's just a really friendly, nice community to be in, and uh, it, within a, a wider, friendly, and nice community of the geospatial world. But, but uh, I, I really do enjoy the open source uh, community uh, especially. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Tom, and, and thanks to both of you for being here with us. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to get into it. I, I want to hear about an aspect of open source GIS that is really exciting. And for our listeners who might not have as much experience uh, with open source GIS, something that might interest them. So Tom, is there something really exciting you'd like to share with us first off? So, so yeah, I mean, the. Um... I used to enjoy using QGIS, but there were certain things I'd usually revert back to ArcGIS for, and, and, and cartography initially, early on, was one of those things. But now, that's my favorite thing. I mean, as my career has developed, I've gone more in towards um, data visualization uh, away from tr more traditional cartography, but some of the tools in, in QGIS are just fantastic. And in particular, I do really like the, uh, the blend modes. Uh, and these are the sorts of effects that you'd usually find in graphics software, uh, but they allow you to mix the colors from layers rather than in usually in, in GIS, you'd be used to using transparencies. But with these blend modes, you can avoid the problems of, of where there's no detail in a layer. But when you use a transparency, if it's just pure white, you get that hazy effect, that, that, that loss of detail on the layers below. But by using uh, the blend modes, you don't get that that effect. And two in particular stand out: the um, the uh, multiply blend mode, which you use for uh, darkening down uh, the lower layers with the upper layers. And this is it's the same as putting two slides in a projector. So you've got one light source shining through the two slides. So on a projection slide, white doesn't is is completely transparent so it doesn't affect the layers below but where there's the darker colors they sh they shine through onto the layers below and you and it gives you a much cleaner much nicer looking multi-layer diagram uh, or, or or map chart whatever it is that you're doing dealing with uh, similarly if you're wanting to brighten up things um, there's the um, the screen blend mode and that's more like taking two projectors each with a slide uh, and shining them on the same screen. So where there's brightness on both, you get an ultra bright effect on the on the um, on the screen there. But if there's a black layer in one of those slides, you're getting no light on there. But the uh, the other one can still project on, over the top of it. So this is really good if you've got a dark um, darken layers and you want to brighten things up. And why I really like these for uh, some of these more like the data visualization uh, stuff is because you can use the effects. Uh, and, and QGIS allows you to put these blend modes not just on the layer itself, but actually the features within the layer. So if you put these uh, uh, point density data, for example, where there's lots and lots of points together, you can you can sort of get these effects where um, the where the where the points are at the most densest, they shine the brightest, or or they darken the most using either of those those blend modes, and it, it really gives you a great looking uh, map without having to um, spend a long time fiddling around with the cartography, the size of the points and these sorts of things. You can you can get this sort of data really speaking for itself very simply. Well, my cartography skills are definitely, uh, definitely nothing to write home about, but that sounds really interesting, Tom. And this is all functionality pretty much available out of the box without any custom add-ons or anything like that? So yeah, that's a, a, a native part of uh, QGIS. I think that was put in there by Niall Dawson, um, uh, and it's it's there in the in the in the styling of the layers. And and that's another really cool thing is you've got live styling of the layers. So there's none of this clicking apply or OK every time you make a little change. You can pop up the the styling thing at the side of QGIS there and just keep tweaking these effects. Yeah. 
and everything happens uh, on the screen live as as it's happening. So um, some obviously zoom in so you don't have too much going on at once. But uh, no, it looks it, it 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 looks good and it and it happens fast and quick in the interface. Well, if we're going to continue on the on the how we look at things mode, I I really like the way that we can save styles. Um, in Postgres and po into your database in Postgres and PostGIS. Um, they're easy to load into different projects and share between colleagues. You can, you can make sure that your maps have a particular look. Um, if you work in other, in, in other databases, you can save them there. You can save them in uh, SQL Server. You can save them in Spatial Light. Um, if you work with geo packages, um, it sounded as though some people might not be familiar with those, but they're really, really helpful. If you're moving information back and forth between proprietary um, software and open source software, um, geo packages will work on both. Um, it's sort of the, the open source guys uh, file based geo database. So you can save huge styles in there or in any of the other databases and it, and it works really well. It makes it simple for a work group to see things in the same way. Um, the other one that, that we've talked about um, in, in preparing for this podcast was the Time Manager plugin. Mm -hmm. um, there's a plugin that allows you to sequence data if it's time stamped. So for example, we're um, assisting the U.S. Virgin Islands in, in creating a street address network. And um, so we can, when we take, a, when we have a location for a new address, we collect that in the field, and then we can show a movie of when each one was collected. Or in our case, we usually generalize it by day. This day we did these, this day we did that, we, they, we did the next, and you accumulate them on the map, and it makes a really interesting time lapse movie. Yeah, I mean that's something that uh, I've also used um, uh, the Time Manager plugin, and the plugin environment in QGIS is another thing that's that that is uh, pretty unique that you can develop these different applications that, that sit on top of the, the QGIS core functionality that allow you to do your own things. They're all usually running uh, in Python, so it's it's quite easy to create your own simple one, but people have created these incredible tools. Uh, and the time manager is is another is, is a, one of my favorites too. And I, I actually use this when uh, teaching some master's students in the ling English literature literature department at the University of Edinburgh. And they'd um, geo-parsed a book. Uh, so they'd taken all the locations out of a book uh, and got coordinates for them. Uh, but also attached as an attribute to, to those locations was the, the sentence number within the book that those locations appeared at. So we took that sentence number as a proxy for time, which is a simple thing to do because it will take any integer as well as a, a timestamp will the, yeah. the, the plugin. And um, so what we did is we created heat maps from groups of, of sentences. So we arranged them into sort of what we term paragraphs, but there'd be a group of sort of 10 sentences, uh, maybe more sometimes pages or chapters. And we'd group these, create heat maps, and then animate those heat maps over the well, not time. Time being the 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 part of the book that the uh, the, the the heat map was created in, but start to finish. And we created this uh, heat map. It's a, a a quick renderer that you can just switch on in uh, on a point data set in QGIS. We use the blend modes, putting that over the Stamen OpenStreetMap base map. Again, we brought that in with another plug in the Quick Map Services that allows access to something like 400 mm -hmm. different base maps from all over the internet. It just lists them out there for you, searchable, so you can just pick the ones you want. The, the Stamen uh, toner base map is that black and white high resolution render of ordinate of the um, open street map there. So these heat maps look really good over the top of that. And then it breaks it up. when you've got those uh, time breaks that in there, it creates um, uh, a, a, a basically a, a little PNG for each individual frame each snapshot in time. So it just takes the points that are in that time frame, renders the heat map, 
and creates an image from that. If you're running this on a Mac or Linux, you, it will actually create an animated GIF for you uh, out of the box. But I use, I'm a Windows user, so I sort of just shoved that into Movie Maker uh, and 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 put these things together. So we have this this video of uh, of a of a map of Europe where all the places in the book and it shows how it shifts from the UK into Europe uh, moves north and west and and then shifts back to the UK and 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 you can see that in the book but actually seeing it on a map in a movie of of of, of the map of the book essentially it, it was quite a powerful tool to to give that sense of place that's why we used a heat map because we weren't looking for precise there wasn't that much precision in the data because it could have been London or it could have been an individual address in London but so we sort of used the heat map to sort of generalize that out but it showed how the sense of place shifted throughout the book and it was a really powerful tool for the student. Oh, I, I was just gonna say that people just love them. We had elected officials putting them on their Facebook pages and um, they were they were really, really huge in promoting um, the idea of addresses in a place where people didn't use them previously. And I think that Tom's example is just perfect. Oh yeah, and I, I really appreciate both of you sharing examples of how open source GIS software can be used to show the temporal aspect of, of data because a lot of times I feel like that's one of the least satisfying or clunkiest uh, uh, types of, of geospatial projects to work with. So it sounds like you're both doing some really exciting and in innovative things with, with temporal data. So thank you. Um, but I'm curious, you know, we've, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, cartographers interested in this, but also folks more concerned with maybe analytic workflows or data management or, you know, working within an enterprise mm -hmm. and wanting to work together. So I'm wondering what are some of some of the other capabilities that, uh, that your colleagues and the students you've worked with uh, get interested in in, in, in in terms of analysis and data management with, with open source? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is kind of where I live because um, uh, Spatial Focus has really been a virtual company most of the time since 1998. And um, collaboration is really where we live. So we save our, um, our QGIS projects to the PostgreSQL database that they're describing, that we're working from. And uh, we can secure shell in, all get the same project, all get the same data, and operate it on, on it independently as we're discussing aspects of a project. And we can arrive at solutions really, really fast because um, it's just so much more powerful than just screen sharing. You always end up like yelling at your colleague going, well, how about we try this? And then it takes forever to get them to try that. This way you try it, and then you say, oh, well, that didn't work. Um, let's try something else. The other thing that's really important is that, is that open source GIS is, is built around consuming data from everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So um, Postgres has a function called foreign data wrappers. And we can query data that's sitting in another database on another machine in the network. It never gets translated. And we can, we can make a query that goes across. We can say, I would like to find um, these items on this database related to those items over in that database and find out how they relate. Count them, check on them, whatever. And it works great. It's fast, it's easy, it's smart. And I can go on forever, but I want to hear from Tom. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it is, a, it is um, a really, really quite powerful in this area. Well, the whole open source and everything does seem to play really, really nicely. So, you know, PostGIS, QGIS was originally developed as a, as a, as a data viewer for Post. Postgres, Postgres databases, a spatial data viewer. So you know everything is playing really, really nicely. And and now with these uh, the geo packages coming along, I love how everything in the open source uh, sphere just seems to play so nicely together with each other. Uh, so QGIS was originally written as a viewer for Postgres and Post Post uh, PostGIS uh, as a as a spatial data viewer. 
Uh, and so they sort of they've been written. They've come, grown up together, essentially. Uh, and then, of, of course, you've got things like GDAL or Goodle, as some people like to pronounce it, uh, and all of these other libraries, Proj4, all these open source libraries that you know are quite important to the commercial GIS sector as well as the open source. But they're all open source projects. They all come under the sort of the FOS4G, free and open source software for Geo umbrella. And so, yeah, they just play really nicely together, really interoperable. Uh, with the geo packages coming along, you've got all of the information wrapped up in a single place in a in a uh, SQLite database based format. But in that geo package, you've got everything. You've got the data, I think raster and vector. Uh, you've got all the styling information. Everything that you need can be wrapped up inside that geo package, shared with anyone. Uh, so it's it's really really easy to just shift your your workspace, share your work, and work with people who are using different software. Uh, and and yeah, you you these projects, open source projects, are just so easy to collaborate on. It's it's fantastic. I think the story about uh, QGIS and PostGIS growing up together is is really at the heart of the thing. Um, when PostGIS was written. Originally, it had no front end. It was just a command line database. Um, and what they said was, you know, this is open source. So we'll write the database, and somebody's going to come along and do the other bits. And they did. So uh, there's a really, really nice um, admin, GUI admin function for PostgreSQL. So if you're not a, if you're not a command line guy, you can do everything that, that I do, um, everything that a, that a, that a pretty um, advanced user would do, um, just with, with a GUI, pointing and clicking and filling in forms. Um, and the hugest aspect of it, seeing the maps and managing the data, that, that also provides a complete GUI. So the things that, that I started out with that only ran in Linux and were by and large command line until you, you know, sort of did whatever you needed to do to, to make a web page or make an image or whatever it was. Well, that's all now GUI, point click. It's it's much more in the in the middle lane of what people expect in a in a GIS experience. You know, with, a, with a few added features. Yeah, so thanks. And you know, when we were preparing for this podcast, I was really surprised to hear about the range and breadth of open source mobile GIS apps that are available today. I work in a in an environment and an organization that's very concerned with mobile data collection. So, you know, assuming someone has had some success with ArcGIS Collector, but is interested in knowing what else is out there, where do you recommend people start? I think it's a really exciting time for mobile data collection uh, for the in the open source uh, side of things. Um, we've got two projects now, two really, really um, good, um, uh, well-resourced, well-funded projects in uh, this um, input and the uh, cloud storage for input called Mergin, which are being developed by Lutra Consulting based here in the UK. And then there's QField, which is being developed by OpenGIS.ch, uh, the Swiss uh, group of people. These are open source projects. Um, obviously, with the input merging uh, option, the input is the app on the phone. Merging is the cloud storage. So they have a, a, a good free tier with 100 megabytes of storage. But um, uh, so you can use this as a, as a, as a free service. Um, but these are just really, really uh, great, great um, mobile apps. I, I've got most experience with the input merging um, uh, project. And basically, um, what it allows you to do is you, you set up your QGIS project. They both work in, in a very similar way, actually. So you're setting up your QGIS project. Uh, QGIS has your, when you, when you uh, create a, a new layer, you can set up a, 
data input form for for that. So you um, you can actually make those different specifications when you're setting up your your layer that you want to input data into uh, within QGIS. The form builder allows you to do things like check boxes, uh, drop down lists, options, that sort of thing, uh, uh, range limit. On, on numerical values, all of these different options are there within QGIS. So you just need to take this QGIS project and um, save that uh, as a project into your merging uh, cloud storage. And then what happens then is you then you can open up your your um, app, input app on and input does work on both. Uh, iOS and uh, and Android, so it's one of the few uh, um, uh, sort of one of these GIS-based data collection apps that that work in both environments there. Uh, and you go out into the field, and you've got access to that layer and that data input form in the field. So I've been using this with a, a local group who are wanting to map some trees uh, in a in a in some in some land that uh, that that. that, that it used to be a hospital, and we're hoping to do a community buyout on that so that the community get access to that land rather than a, uh, a big developer. So they want to go in there and record all this information about the trees. So we've I've set this up so that you can record species uh, and, and sort of some size parameters, the, the uh, girth at breast height. Uh, on on the tree there and um, some other different features. You know we haven't we yet to we yet to explore the full potential of this. Perhaps something about the the health of the tree or it's uh, you know if it's in need of any any kind of attention. Um, just so we can record all of this information nice and simply and you know with with very little uh, effort. The way that the Lutra have designed this is it just takes what you've got in the form there and creates this really nice and simple interface. To use on the uh, on the app there, um, so we're going to hope you know the volunteers we're dealing with here are um, many of them are old age pensioners, these these sorts of more mature people um, who are maybe not so tech savvy, but we think this is just going to be so easy for them to use. Uh, obviously, they know a bit about their trees, or they'll get the training to to be able to uh, take the measurements correctly. Um, but I, I know I know that this is essentially how. Um, Qfield is working as well, except it doesn't have the cloud storage. So you have to, at the moment, I know they are actually de developing it as we speak. But um, with that one, you just have to ma manually uh, load the uh, the the project into the into your mobile device um, via um, a USB or something cable, something like that. But yeah, essentially. Yeah. It's really, really good. So we're hoping to get this app up and running soon. So using using that free tier, we can we can collect the information about the trees and hopefully uh, help help when it comes to the community buyout of the land. Yeah, we're we're using QField in the Virgin Islands for the simple reason that it isn't a cloud application, because internet connections are so um, they they tend to be slow and unreliable. Um, we can usually get email through, but any kind of any kind of something where we're where we're going to have to get access at a particular time may or may not happen. Um, so the Q field works great for us. It has um, all of those widgets that Tom was talking about. Um, we found that we can even um, capture some kinds of data we 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 want to capture um, some fairly complicated text strings in the field and make sure that they're exactly right. So we can use um, a Bluetooth enabled um, barcode scanner and use QR codes in the field, go right into QField, go right into the database. And everything is everything is read and it's it's fine. Nobody has to type anything. Um, that means a lot to us. Um, the Q field, the QGIS, Q field, POCHIS, POSTGIS production suite makes a really complete database that we can quality control. You get raw data from the field, you quality control it. We can put it in a geo package and it slides right into our client's RTIS setup without a, without a second thought. 
Great, nice, nice that uh, that you're able to integrate with um, with your clients' platforms while using uh, while using QField. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm curious for both of you, what uh what do you see in terms of larger organizations uh, using open source GIS? I know where I'm at, most large organizations are Esri based. Do you see any trends have, or, or across your career, have you seen any trends in terms of larger organizations exploring or adopting open source GIS technology? Well, I think here in the UK, um, local government has really been picking up on, uh, on open source and a few other um, larger sort of government bodies like the land registry here in Scotland uh, the registers of Scotland have recently converted everything over to open source and uh, in terms of their, their GIS. Um, so they started by getting everyone to, to, to take Python courses so that all the scripting that was going on could, could, could be done in, in Python. And then from there, that ground up approach shifted everyone into using uh, PostGIS and QGIS for all of their, their needs. And we're seeing this in the local councils too, but it's not, really necessarily um, a complete conversion uh, some like the land registry did but what we're seeing now is more or less a blend of of open source and proprietary there are certain things that that due to history or or the way that the data is coming in to certain departments in a council that they need to keep their uh, ArcGIS seats but for a lot of the other stuff they're they're happy to 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 take that open source route, and I think I think that is 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 sort of uh, the approach we're seeing in the academic sector as well. I found that you know in the in, certainly where I've been working, a lot of the the science based faculty are all interested in in things like ArcGIS and proprietary, whereas some of the others, the 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 digital humanities, that's a, a really uh, growth area in in UK. Uh, higher education at least they're, they're quite focused and keen on tools like QGIS that they know that their students will be able to go on out into the world and still carry on doing that interesting research or work because they're not necessarily going to end up in a company that will be paying out for a uh, um, uh, proprietary GIS so um, but it, yeah even some of the bigger companies what we're seeing is a rise in the number of these small medium-sized um, open source uh, focused GIS support companies that are there now offering the, the level of support package that you would see traditionally from a big proprietary GIS to companies that want to move into open source so that they're actually getting that telephone support, um, someone that will come and fix the problems for them if something breaks, which normally you would think in open source that, that that was something you'd have to do yourself or employ someone with those skills to be able to do it but actually those support packages are now being offered by companies like Lutra and um, uh, Aston Technology here in the UK there's, there's the Q Cooperative which is a, a loose group of experts in QGIS that has formed and they're producing these these um, uh, these these support packages so that so that there's that comfort level for the larger companies to come and say, well, actually, no, we've got a we've got a, a service level agreement with someone on this software, so we can use it. Yeah, and in America, you see you see a lot of open source in places where it can be it can be seen and not seen. Um, for example, Carter DB, um, a lot of the online. Um, mapping facilities, um, you know, cloud mapping companies, CardoDB, Mapbox, you know, they're all going to use PostGIS. Um, some of the some of the scientific organizations in the government, NOAA, um, NASA, all of those guys, they're PostGIS users. Um, and there's um, there are routing companies that do things like um, ride the city maps for bikers, that sort of thing. And they're using PostGIS with PG routing, the routing um, module for, for the software. Um, and yeah. of course, um, PostGIS is highly, is pretty tightly tied to OpenStreetMap. I don't even have to download the OpenStreetMap data to pull it into PostGIS. 
I can just say, mm-hmm. I want this piece, put it in my database, please. And it says, yes, ma'am, how high? <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> well, I want to be mindful of our time. Uh, but I really appreciate you both. This has been very, very eye-opening for me. I thought that I knew a decent amount about open source GIS uh, coming into this, but I can see now that I have barely scratched the surface. So thank you both for your time and expertise. Uh, Sarah, do you have any final thoughts to share with us? And also tell folks where they can learn more about your work and more about your projects. Um, They can go to www.spatialfocus.com. And um, we'll be we'll be posting more stuff there. Um, yeah, that's that's where we are. My I think my final thought is, when you're looking at at open source, just relax. It's not a religion. You're not choosing sides. You need to, as you started out with, use the right right tool for the right job, and just look mm-hmm. at it, see what you think. You're a geographer. Your, your alliance is to the data. Make sure that you serve your clients and your data well, and you'll be happy. Wow, I'm inspired. <laughs> Tom, any final thoughts for us? Well, for me, yeah, I mean, the, that that's exactly right. Sarah's uh, hit the nail on the head there. Um, and so, yeah, just use the best tool for the job. But if you want to learn more about um, the open source uh, geo uh, world, then have a look at the OzGeo uh, website. Um, that's yeah. where all of these open source projects are shown. If you have a, uh, a geo piece of software that you've been working on and want to turn it into um, some sort of um, open source project with other people collaborating, then they've got the tools to help you there as well. Um, so great and look for phosphor g events that's the biggest thing um hopefully once uh, this situation that we're in at the moment is ended uh, we'll be able to go out and meet in person again and these phosphor g events are um absolutely uh, fantastic they're great they're very open they're very inclusive um it's part of the core of of uh, phosphor g that everything and everyone should feel free to be able to uh express their their views and opinions and and no one should be uh marginalized at all so um they but they are generally they're quite a lot more fun and a lot more relaxed than some of the uh the, the propriety uh geo events not all i know that a lot of those are really good fun too but uh no the 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 phosphor g ones are great and there's a really great sense of community and you can get together with people and uh and and solve problems and and come up with new software ideas and you'll be in a room full of people that can Bring some of that to life. So uh, check out the events and check out the uh, the OzGeo website as well. Um, for my part, you can have a look at my blog, um, learngis.uk, uh, where I share a lot of data visualization techniques in QGIS. Um, and I'm quite active on Twitter as MapNavTom, uh, if you want to have a look. But, and the social media is another great place to find out lots of information about uh, open source geo and, and, and free and open source software for geo. So yeah, um, join the community. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, those are yeah. great resources. And uh, Tom Armitage and Sarah Yerman, I really appreciate your energy and enthusiasm. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to Barbary at Directions Magazine and the team at Eurissa for making this possible. See you next time.